The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today for our next uh, <laughs> webinar series. Um, this is the second in a series that we're doing with um, the folks at Cancer Careers and Navigating Cancer Survivorship. And we're so happy to have them here with us today. This is Cancer in the Workplace Part 2, Returning to Work. Um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce our presenters today. And um, before I do that, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, I am going to be fielding questions that folks have during the course of the webinar. So if you have a question, feel free to type it in. And we'll do our best to get all of those answered um, either sort of around the time that they show up or maybe at the end of the presentation. I know that um, Eva and Monica or will leave a few moments for folks to answer questions. And if for some reason we don't get to your question or it's super specific to your situation, then I'll pass it along to the presenters and um, one of us will be sure to get back to you. Um, so hopefully all of you had a chance to fill out the short little Survey Monkey um, survey beforehand. Um, and hopefully um, many of you will also take just two minutes. There'll be a link at the end of the presentation um, for a quick post survey. And um, all that data is super important to us. So we really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Um, and also uh, Lee, um, one of our other staff um, staff members here is going to be live tweeting um, at hashtag SamFunWebinar. Is that right, Lee? I think so. I think that's right. She'll correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so feel free to follow along there to check that out afterwards. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our presenters uh, today. I, hope, I think a few of you may have joined us last week as well or heard um, downloaded the presentation, which um, you can find at uh, the samfund.org slash webinar. And this presentation also will be archived there. Hopefully you've gotten a chance to check out our new website. So um, Eva Lamana is a manager of programs at Cancer and Careers. And in this role, she does everything from coordinating events, including the National Conference on Work and Cancer, to managing the Cancer and Careers website in English and Spanish, and representing Cancer and Careers at conferences and seminars all over the country. Prior to joining Cancer and Careers, she worked with nonprofits including AIDS Athens, Animal Legal Defense Fund, and the Center for HIV Law and Policy. And she holds a BA from the University of Florida and a JD from the University of Georgia School of Law. And Monica Fozzie Bryant is a cancer rights attorney, speaker, and author. And she is the Chief Operating Officer for Navigating Cancer Survivorship, a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing education and resources on cancer survivorship issues. Throughout her career, she's provided numerous educational seminars across the country, written articles and blogs, and appeared on community television and radio shows discussing healthcare-related legal issues. Additionally, Monica is an adjunct law professor at the John Marshall School of Law in Chicago, teaching a class on cancer rights. So thank you so much for joining us, ladies. I think um, we're going to start with Eva, so I'm just going to give her the slides here so everyone just be patient with our little transitions, and we will get started. Okay, great. Uh, thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks for having me back today. Thank um, you. So a little bit about uh, Cancer and Careers. Um, Cancer and Careers just celebrated its 10th anniversary last year. It was the only program dedicated to providing practical guidance and access to experts on all issues pertaining to cancer and work. From our accredited program for healthcare professionals to our online and print resources, we're your one-stop shop for credible information on balancing cancer and employment. Be sure to check out our website at www.cancerandcareers.org for up-to-date event listings, new publications, free online career coaching, and much more. And now I'm just going to let Monica tell you a little bit about navigating cancer survivorship. And Monica? Uh, Monica sent me a little message that said it looked that she thought that she was muted, but she does not look muted on my end. <laughs> it looks like she should have sound. Let's try again. I'm going to mute her and unmute her. There we go. Monica, can you? Hello. There we are. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so thanks again so much for having us on. Um, Navigating Cancer Survivorship is a nonprofit organization that's relatively new. And our mission is to provide information and resources on the entire continuum of cancer survivorship issues. So today we're going to be talking about employment and some of the legal issues, but we also deal with things like um, sexuality and intimacy, pain management, 
So we have a ton of information on our website and our blog. We also um, participate in seminars all over the country. And for any of you who are listening who um, are responsible for organizing educational events at your particular organizations, we host a speakers panel where um, we can connect you with experts on a variety of issues. OK, great. Um, so I'm just going to start off. Um, today you're going to get an overview from me and Monica about different employment, insurance, and legal issues that can arise when you're returning to work. So to start, I'm just going to share a story with you about Erin, who's really an example of the kinds of issues we hear and questions that come up all the time. So after college, Erin worked as an assistant at a large company for three years. At the age of 24, she was diagnosed with cancer. After talking with her healthcare team, she decided her best course of action was to take some time off work. When she shared her diagnosis with her employer, she was told she would be let go. Erin took COBRA to keep her health insurance coverage, but her 18 months are up and she's concerned about how to get insurance coverage with a pre-existing condition. She's now 26, she's ready to get back into the workforce, uh, especially since she has student loans to pay back and a whole pile of outstanding medical bills. Erin's not sure how to deal with the gap on her resume and how to address it in an interview, or if she even has to. Erin uh, also has monthly medical appointments and has been experiencing chemo brain. She's worried this will keep her from getting a job. So hopefully by the end of the call, you'll have a better sense of what Aaron, uh, some of Erin's options might be. OK, so to start, um, I'm going to start with uh, thinking about returning to work. So in looking at this, you'll want to think about a variety of things. First, any physical issues like chemo brain, where your strength and stamina lie, what your social and emotional needs are, and of course, you'll want to consider any practical and financial challenges as well. If you're still in treatment, how much longer are you in treatment for if that's even knowable at this point? And then how you'll work that out as far as going back to work and what you might do if you need to take the time off again. Uh, some other factors you'll want to think about uh, include your length of absence, your disability status, any work preferences and goals you might have, as well as the current economic conditions. And don't forget, you should really ask yourself if you actually still want to do the work of your former job. And before entirely dismissing your previous employer, I really encourage you to think about if there's a role you could imagine for yourself there, and if so, to explore that along with any new opportunities. Um, so job search. There's a ton of challenges and unknowns when looking for a new job. This is true for everybody. Uh, so it's really important to feel in control of the process. To start, remember that it's fluid. It can take time. You should think about what you want, not just what you need. And it might also help to think about how you'll manage any disappointments and setbacks. So when looking at this slide, the most important thing about it isn't that it turns out that job boards aren't the way the majority of people get a job, but rather it's important to understand that your job search needs to be really multifaceted. You shouldn't just depend on job boards. A job search sites can be very useful for getting a sense of what people are looking for and how they're describing the skills they're hiring for. And in advance of an interview, um, they can really provide some useful tidbits about the company. So networking. Uh, according to one of Cancer and Career's professional career coaches, over 85% of jobs are found through other people versus those job boards, headhunters, or ads of any kind. Basically, anyone you know can be a source for networking. It's important not to think too narrowly like, oh, only people you've worked with before in your professional network, because that's just not the case. Unfortunately, with networking, Many people tend to be uncomfortable with the idea of it. Uh, this could be because they don't know how to go about it. They don't like to ask for help. It can be a little uncomfortable. Um, so it's important for you to realize that most people are willing to help if they're able to, if you're able to articulate exactly what you need, and you know, kind of approach networking as a reciprocal process. Getting the word out that you're looking is really more than half the battle. And as a reference, Cancer and Careers has a great networking tracker tool that can be downloaded from our website and it helps you kind of track the progress that you're making with everyone and stay organized. So LinkedIn, um, 
has really become the go-to source for employers looking to hire. It's really cost-effective, especially compared to hiring a search firm or a headhunter. Given that it's being used so much to find talent, make sure you're u utilizing it to its fullest potential. Uh, write a compelling profile about yourself, put yourself in the, your best light, uh, ask for strategic and substantive recommendations, and post professional updates and consider joining some relevant groups. So online brand, um, we here at Cancer and Careers feel very strongly that people think through the decisions they make about what they post online. Obviously, social media and technology has become an incredibly important component to survivorship, providing immediate support and community, but there are definitely some things to consider. So not necessarily maliciously, but employers Google candidates just to see what comes up. So make sure you know exactly what's coming up about yourself. Remember to set privacy settings on things like Facebook so that nothing can be seen. And if you can, really try to keep up with all of their privacy setting changes, because we know they change pretty often these days. Also consider that profile picture carefully if it's public. Make sure those wild vacation photos are on lockdown. But also consider how you're talking about your cancer in these public spaces. You don't intend to tell your current or future employers about your cancer treatment and recovery. Sites designed for support that have a high level of privacy, like My Lifeline and CaringBridge, can be a really good option for a safe space for you to talk about your diagnosis with only those people you select. Consider this. If you decided not to tell at work, but you're blogging publicly about your diagnosis or treatment, then you essentially have told, because now it's online and in the public domain. And once it's on the web, it does not go away. So most importantly, you need to be mindful of the decisions you're making and the fact that it has both a short and long-term effect. So to start, you'll need to create an effective resume. OK, well, what is an effective resume? We think it's definitely written with the audience in mind. It's a succinct summary of capabilities and accomplishments. And it's easy to read and understand. Um, make sure you use a style that's professional and has impact. Keep it future focused instead of a regurgitation of everything you've ever done in your work. And keep it targeted towards your career goal. There's also more than one kind of resume. So for instance, we're probably most familiar with the chronological one. It's the most common. That's going to take the reader through your work experience job by job with the most recent first. But there's also another kind that's a chronological functional resume. And this is a hybrid that's arranged by highlighting skill sets and accomplishments on top and specific job experience lower down. This might be preferable for someone who has several gaps in their work history, um, especially ones that they don't want to draw attention to. So just some other tips. Um, use years on resumes, not months. Include any non-traditional volunteer work you may have done. Um, Make it about two pages. If you're a recent grad, one is completely fine. Try to have a profile or summary at top. Um, if you want a little help with these, we have several samples uh, up on our website. And make sure you use uh, keywords for scanning software, since a lot of companies now are just scanning resumes and picking out specific words. Um, we also have some sample resumes on our website that you can download and use as references. And in 2013, only about a month or two, we're piloting a resume review service. So we're going to be offering a free of charge assessment for all survivors um, by one of our expert career coaches. So definitely be on the lookout for that. These next two slides just provide some examples of the elements of an effective resume. So this is a quick example of a sample profile. Um, they do not have to be this long but they should try to highlight key elements about the applicant as a summary. It can be a good move to look at a few sample resumes from different sources just to get a feel for them. And here's just some sample keywords. Um, again, there are many, many more. And there are job sites and books um, just dedicated to this topic that list tons of them. Um, so check these out as you're developing your new resume. I think when it comes to cover letters, uh, the two best pieces of advice are don't just regurgitate your resume. This is really an opportunity to use your words um, to draw parallels or highlight an experience that makes you uniquely suited to the role. And 
is maybe obvious, but don't use a generic letter that isn't tying you to the specific company or job in question. Okay, so interviewing. Like with the resume, one of the biggest fears that I hear all the time is how am I going to explain my time off due to my cancer treatment in an interview, and will that stop me from getting a job? In the initial, initial stages of a job search, you'll want to be prepared for questions related to gaps in employment history. But one expected upside to the current economic situation is that employers today are used to seeing candidates with some gaps due to many, many reasons. So they may not even ask about yours. And if it comes up, just be future focused, non-specific, and brief. What's really most important to a prospective employer is how you can solve their problems and meet their needs to be prepared. To, so be prepared to speak about that. Practice, practice, practice your answers so that you can really be at ease during your interview. And another important thing to keep in mind is although cancer is forefront in your mind, it's really not for the person sitting across the table. Just try and remember that you'd be an asset to them and that this is your opportunity to dazzle them with how and why. And now I'm just going to pass it over to Monica who can uh, tell us kind of the legal side of things. Thank you, but just give me one second. Okay, so um, I think that Eva has just given us some amazing practical tips about what to think about when um, you're job searching. And frankly, whenever I hear all of those tips, I always think that it's so pertinent for anybody looking for a job. Um, but now I just kind of want to switch gears a little bit and focus on the actual laws that are relevant when you are searching for a job. And for those of you who were on our first part of this webinar, some of this may be um, a repeat, but the best way to really solidify that you understand what we're talking about is to hear it more than once. So bear with me. So the two main areas of law that we're going to talk about today is the federal law called Americans with Disability Act, or the ADA. And that deals with um, non-discrimination for people who have disabilities. There are also some state fair employment laws that are going to be relevant. But it's important when you're thinking about what your rights and benefits are to not just think about what the law provides you, because the law is really just the bare minimum of what employers have to give you. And many employers are, in fact, more generous. So it's important to look to your employee contract or your union contract um, to figure out what benefits your employer might give you above and beyond the law. So some of the things that you're going to want to look for in your employer policies are what benefits are being offered to you. Um, and I think that this is especially relevant for people who are looking for jobs who have a cancer diagnosis. So what benefits are they going to provide? Are you going to have health insurance, dental insurance? Um, what types of disability policies are going to be offered to you? Um, and perhaps even some life or accidental death insurance policies. So those might be something worth considering when you're figuring out, is this a job that I'm going to want to take or not? You also want to look to some other benefits. How much sick time is that employer going to give you? Do they offer a vacation or paid time off? Um, is this a type of employer that has um, a pool of donated hours that you might be able to draw from if, say, um, you have a reoccurrence? Um, what, other, what are other employees being offered? Are there employees that are doing um, flex time or telecommuting? Because that might be something relevant to you if you're either still going through treatment or if you have a diagnosis that's going to require going back for several checkups. So I think it's really important that when you're thinking about, you know, is this a job that I want to take, it's not necessarily always just about what's the salary or what's the position, but some of these other benefits and policies are things that you might want to be thinking about. Okay, so the ADA, again, is a federal law that deals with non-discrimination based on the disability. Now, in order to use the protections of the ADA, there are a few hurdles that you have to jump. And the first hurdle is that you have to work for a big enough employer. So for the ADA, that means a private employer with 15 or more employees. Also, it applies to all state and local governments. 
So once we figured out, okay, you're, you, you work for a big enough employer, you also have to be a qualified individual. So being a qualified individual means that you can perform the essential functions of the job with or without reasonable accommodations. Boiled down, what that means is you're qualified for the job we're talking about. So if you're applying to be a commercial truck driver, you have a commercial driver's license. If you are applying to be a um, prosecutor or a state's attorney, you are actually a lawyer who's passed the bar in that state. You're qualified for the job we're talking about. And then lastly, you have a disability under the ADA. Now, under the ADA, a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. It's a complete mouthful, so let's break it down a little bit. So first, so you have a physical or mental impairment. And when you're thinking about your physical or mental impairment, it may not be the cancer itself that we're talking about, but rather perhaps side effects from the treatment. A very common one that we hear um, all the time is chemo brain, right? The mental side effects of going through chemotherapy. So you have a physical or mental impairment, and that physical or mental impairment is going to limit something called a major life activity. Now, when the law was passed, major life activities included things like eating, breathing, walking, working could be considered a major life activity, and that was great. Um, but in 2008, uh, the Congress went back and passed the ADA Amendments Act. And it expanded the definition of what is to be considered a major life activity. So now it also includes things like concentrating, thinking, operation of major bodily functions. And typically when I give this presentation, there's someone in the audience that always yells out, that's, those are the side effects of chemo. And that's essentially it, is that by expanding the definition of what a major life activity is, Congress made that hurdle just a little bit shorter or lower for people who are coping with cancer to be able to use the protections of the ADA. Okay, so physical or mental impairment that limits one of these major life activities, and it doesn't just limit it a little bit. So it's not just that you have, you know, one sleepless night but rather it's a substantial limitation. So, you know, you're really only sleeping a few hours a night. Um, you can't keep any food down. It's really challenging for you to um, remember tasks uh, without writing them down. So it's a substantial limitation. So once we figured out that you are eligible to use the protections of the ADA, there's actually four different ways to use it. So the first way is that you currently have that physical or mental impairment. So you're going through treatment, um, or even you're on the tail end of it, but you're still really suffering from chemo brain, and it's just um, really challenging to get through the days. The second way is that you have a history of a physical or mental impairment. And that could be a situation where, um, let's say that you uh, have gone through treatment and um, you're five years out and, um, you know, you're doing great and, and you're not really suffering from any side effects at the moment, but an employer is now treating you differently because of your history of your diagnosis. Also, the third way is being regarded as having a disability. So this might be a situation where, you know, you're going through treatment and um, you have absolutely no side effects, so you're feeling fine, you're one of those anomalies, except that you've lost all your hair. So you go into an interview, and um, because you have a bald head, the interviewer automatically assumes that, um, you know, or figures out that you have cancer and starts now treating you differently because you are being regarded as having a disability, even though you're, you're good to go and you're fine and you can work and do all the job requirements. Now the last way is based on your association with a person with a disability. And this is a way for caregivers to access the protections of the ADA. It can be a lot more challenging than some of the other ways, but it isn't impossible. This comes up, I've heard this come up in the context of um, HIV and AIDS quite a bit, where people are um, just ignorant about the way that the virus is passed. Um, but we, we could think of it in the cancer context as well. So let's say, for example, um, your 
boss or potential boss was caregiver to um, her mother. And she knows that she had a really challenging time being a caregiver and getting all of her work done at the same time. And she knows that you are a caregiver to your mother who's suffering from cancer. So she's now saying, based on your association with, I don't think that you're going to be able to do the job and start treating you differently. So I know that's a lot of information, and I hope that that all makes sense, but I'm happy to answer questions about it later if it doesn't. But moving on, if you fall under any one of these prongs, you are protected under the ADA from discrimination based on your disability. And if you listen to part one, you also learn a little bit about reasonable accommodations, which is um, modifications in your work environment to help you do your job if you have a disability. And I just want to remind everyone that you're only entitled to reasonable accommodations if you fall under that first prong where you currently have a physical or mental impairment that's substantially limiting a major life activity. Okay, so I get this question a lot where people are trying to figure out if they have to tell their employers or potential employers if they have a cancer diagnosis um, and how much they have to tell them. Now, generally, uh, you do not have to tell your employer anything about your health status. Now, I think generally because there are some exceptions to that. So if you are trying to use the protections of the ADA, you may need to disclose that you have a serious medical condition, right? You may need to disclose that you have a disability. However, you don't have to say the word cancer. And so for some people, their cancer diagnosis is something that they want to keep private and don't, doesn't want that to come into their work life. So it's important to know that even if you're trying to use the ADA, even if you're trying to access reasonable accommodations or take medical leave, you might have to say that you have a serious medical condition, but you never have to use the word cancer. So when, because this is all about job search, when you are in the process of searching for a job, before you are offered a job, employers are limited as to what they can ask you. So before you're offered that job, really the only thing that an employer can ask you is can you perform the essential functions of the job, which if you remember goes back to that definition of being a qualified individual, and how will you perform the essential functions of the job. So it's really about are you, even with your disability, are you able to perform the job? And how are you going to perform the job? Now, once you've been offered the job, employers are able to ask some disability-related questions or ask you to submit to a medical exam. However, that's only okay if every single employee in your job category is asked the same thing. So they can't just come in and look at your bald head and think, mm, she might have cancer, he might have cancer, so we're going to make him go through a medical exam before we offer this job to them, or before we accept his job, accept him into the job. It's only okay if every one of the same job categories asks to do this medical exam. Also, once you're employed, you're only able or employers are only able to ask you to subject to a medical exam if it's job related and consistent with business necessity. So I think of this um, when you're talking about um, maybe if you are um, one of those giant crane operators at a construction site, it would be acceptable to perhaps ask your employees to submit to eye exams to make sure that they can actually see what they're doing. So if it's related to the job, that's acceptable. So I, I already mentioned briefly that if you fall under that first prong of the ADA, that you currently have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, you may be entitled to something called a reasonable accommodation. And that's any change in the work environment that enables an individual with a disability to enjoy equal employment opportunities like everybody else. 
And so Eva is going to just give us a few examples, um, some concrete examples of what reasonable accommodations might look like. OK, great. Yep, so these are just some basic ways that you can modify your space and schedule. So starting with your workspace, um, try to think about how you can make your workplace more comfortable and productive, and then modify as needed. So simple things like set up your workspace so you don't have to expend any unnecessary energy. If a special chair is more comfortable, bring one in. Um, maybe think about a backrest rest or a pillow. If you sit at a desk, put your phone, your files, your printer, uh, all within easy reach. It may help to provide your supervisor with a letter of medical necessity for chairs or other equipment just to ease this process. And then next slide. Thanks. Um, so that was a little bit uh, about space and now schedule. Uh, a few options to think about when trying to develop a workable schedule. And of course, these aren't one size fits all, but just to get you thinking. Can you work from home either part or full time? This can eliminate a draining commute. Uh, it can enable you to lie down when necessary. The key to successful telecommuting is to really structure the arrangement by setting up an agreement with your employer that sets down basic factors. So what hours you'll be working, how you'll be reachable, are you on email or phone, how you'll indicate when you're away from your desk. This could be away messages on IM, voicemail, email, and maybe what your equipment needs are, whether it's a phone line, a computer, a printer, access to office servers, etc. Also think through if you can work a full-time but flexible schedule. So this would mean You'd continue working full time, but vary the start and end times. Uh, vary the start and end times your work day, or take time out during the work day to go to appointments, and make the time up by working later that day or later in the week. Another strategy is to work a part time schedule during all or part of treatment and recovery, and then ramp up as you're able to. As I said, with any of these suggestions, it'll depend on the kind of job you have. You know a. A second grade teacher, for instance, isn't going to be able to legitimately telecommute, but the trick is to be both creative and logical when you present these solutions to your employer. And now Monica can explain even more in-depth modifications. So the other, we just want to really make people think about um, the jobs that they have and what would be a good reasonable accommodation for them. Because the trick about these accommodations is in fact that they have to be reasonable. So Eva mentioned the idea of telecommuting. Well, if you're that second grade teacher or um, a commercial truck driver, telecommuting is probably not going to be considered a reasonable accommodation for you. So, when you're thinking about these options, think about uses of technology. So maybe the idea is that you have um, a smartphone or a tablet or a laptop that you are able to take with you to appointments and maybe continue to work from there. Um, also look for um, changes in policy. So there was a court case about um, a valet who needed frequent restroom breaks, but the hotel policy was that employees weren't able to use the bathrooms in the lobby. And so through this court case, the court decided that the valet was in fact able to use um, a restroom closer to his work site. It might also be that you need to shift your job responsibilities slightly, um, or maybe even change your job completely. So there is a wonderful uh, resource uh, called the Job Accommodation Network. And its sole purpose, or its main purpose, is to help people figure out what would be a good, reasonable accommodation for their job and their situation. So their website is um, askjan.gov. OK, so we talked a little bit about the ADA already. But I also just want to mention that each state actually has a state fair employment law as well. Most of them are very similar to the ADA, but they are, in fact, sometimes more protective. And the way that they are more protective, there's three different ways. The first is that some of them have a broader definition of disability. Um, also, some specifically list cancer as a potential disability. Now, 
in these states that specifically list cancer as a disability, it's not going to be a de facto ruling that if you are diagnosed with cancer, you are protected by the state fair employment law. But rather, when we go back to my hurdle analogy, it just makes that hurdle a little bit lower to jump over if you do have cancer. Also, some states cover employees with fewer, I'm sorry, cover employers with fewer than 15 employees. So that's a really fantastic trend um, that we're seeing so that people who work for smaller businesses are in fact protected in the workplace. Okay, so just before we end, I want to touch on new jobs with new employers. One of the best things about this is that it's a completely fresh start. Uh, according to our coaches, research shows that your first 90 days in a new job is a real make it or break it time for success. So this is the time that you're assimilating, you're managing your energy, meeting all these new people, learning the office culture, and developing relationships. You don't need to work a million hours. And instead of focusing on how many hours need to be worked, focus instead on creating a simple plan for the things I just mentioned. Break everything down into small pieces when it feels overwhelming. Learn and understand what it means to be successful in your new company. And remember, every company is dysfunctional. And also, just take care of yourself physically and mentally, and keep reminding yourself of all of your past accomplishments. And now I think Monica can just close us out. So this is just a listing um, of some fantastic resources for um, people to have. And I just want to say I apologize because I think I may have just given you the wrong website for AskJan. It's AskJan.org. Um, I think I gave you gov. So it's AskJan.org is the job accommodation network that can assist you with figuring out what would might be a good reasonable accommodation. Also, um, if you think that you are being discriminated against, the federal agency um, that you uh, would need to access is the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, or the EEOC. Um, also, if you are looking for an attorney to do, um, there's the National Cancer Legal Services Network, which is NCLSN. Apologize for that typo. Um, they are a network of legal services agencies all over the country that you can access. Um, and then also, because we can't, uh, in, with good conscience, talk about the idea of cancer and jobs without also talking about health insurance options, um, I just want to remind everyone about the great government's website called healthcare.gov that you can access for your health insurance issues. And this is the contact information for Eva and I, so you can feel free um, to contact us or our respective organizations if you have any questions that we aren't able to answer today or if you have specific inquiries. Great. Thank you guys so much. That was fantastic. A lot of really useful information. I think a lot of people are going to benefit from that. Um, we actually haven't had any questions throughout. I don't know if you guys were just super thorough or this is a quiet <coughs> crowd, but if um, people have questions, please feel free to to type them in now because we do have a little bit of time left. So wait a second to see if folks get brave as they start uh, chiming in. It's a miracle that we actually finished early. I know. I saw. I looked at the clock. <laughs> Never <I> happened. <laughs> You're very concise and uh, provided the most important info. And we are going to make these slides available as well as a PDF, so um, folks will be able to download um, that and you can have those all of those resources um, handy. A lot of great references there. Well, I'm not seeing any questions, so I guess that means you were um, super thorough and informative. Um, if folks do have questions, feel free to send them into webinars at the samfund.org and we can pass them along to the presenters. Um, but if we don't have any questions, I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, thank you again so much, Monica, Eva, you guys. Um, this has been a fantastic two-part series, and we'd love to have you back again anytime. So thank you. Thank you. Anytime. Thanks so much. <laughs> and um, just a, another bit of housekeeping here. Um, hold on. I'm going to show you my last slide here. So great, yes, so um, the presentation will be available um, on our website sometime in the next couple of days. Um, so 
so you can download a copy of it there. We will also have last week's, um, I think last week's we actually just got up on our, on our website, or the one from um, November 28th, which is the first part of this series. And please, everybody, if you could take a minute to complete the post-webinar survey. This is really important for making sure that the program is strong and also for showing that the program um, is useful to you so that we can get grant funding to continue it in future years. So please do take a minute to fill that out. And as always, if you have ideas for future topics or you just have general feedback you want to share, just shoot us an email, webinars at thesamfund.org. So um, I think with that, um, I hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us.